Oh, yeah, that would be pretty cool to watch. What's up, amigos? It is value after hours. Uh, it's 10.30 a.m. on the West Coast, 1.30 p.m. on the East Coast. It's 5.30 p.m. UTC, 5.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. We are live. If you want to come and watch us live, go to the YouTube uh, channel for the Acquirers podcast and click to get notifications. It'll let you know. What's happening, gents? It's a one-year anniversary of the bottom. Generational oh, yeah. buying opportunity one year ago today. Crazy. This is the best that your 12-month look back is going to look. So, uh, screenshot it. <laughs> it's all crap from here. Pump out all the marketing material today. That's right. Get it out. That's what I'm doing. Good luck with the tech. Thanks. Fingers crossed, everybody. No, that doesn't go down. So I got a, I got a good topic for today. It's um, uh, JP Morgan has this article, "The Agony and the Ecstasy." It's about uh, concentrated stock portfolios and how many businesses fail, how many companies fail. And the Russell three thousand uh, came via uh, the irrelevant investor. So I appreciated the link there. What are you guys uh, talking about today? I'll probably just piggyback on you and then talk about the power of doing nothing. Hmm. How's that fit into your epic rant that is on deck? I don't know how epic it'll be. We'll see. <laughs> Let's find something to get you wound up. <laughs> I'm, I'm plenty wound. I just don't know how wound I want to get. It's 4.30 a.m. in Melbourne. Uh, sorry, I might have got those times wrong. I guess you're on your own. Don't no listen cares. to me. <laughs> All right. I have a uh, little per piece prepared. They say that right. right? Piece prepared for uh, it's called a beautiful portfolio, and this mm. is going to be uh, talking about some of Paul Graham's uh, work. So, good name. Um, Maybe should uh, well, why don't I'll I'll take it away because uh, uh, I've got the conch and I'm always lazy and I finally prepared <laughs> something. So here here I go. Yes. <laughs> So that nice bit, the, the it's a JP Morgan paper, The Agony and the Ecstasy, The Risks and Rewards of a Concentrated Stock Position. They looked in the Russell 3000. Basically, 40% of Russell 3000 com uh, companies uh, have negative absolute returns. So you'd have been better off holding cash uh, in that instance. And so the, the reason that I wanted to highlight it, because I think that this is potentially something you could put into your uh, list of just stuff to be careful of. They listed out what are the primary reasons for business failure. And so, um, the first one is commodity price risks that cannot be hedged away. So, we probably already knew that, so just be careful of the commodity businesses. Government policy. This, so, this is a really long one. They, they're just about anything that they can change uh, can hurt you, including re-regulation and deregulation so when the uh when the fed's moving around you just gotta when the federal government's moving around you got to be a little bit careful there intellectual property infringement by domestic or foreign firms foreign competitors whose market share is magnified by government s subsidies mm. um, the impact of patent trolls patent trolls changes in u.s or foreign government tariff or trade policy fraud by non-executive employees a shift in buying power to the firm's customers resulting from consolidation unconstrained expansion by competitors so i don't know how useful that list is but it's just kind of an interesting uh everything ev everything that can go <laughs> wrong d all of the above i don't know how much of that you could identify prospectively like maybe be careful of commodity businesses maybe be careful of businesses that um, uh, heavily regulated or not regulated at all. I don't know. I don't think that there's anything that... Or somewhere in between. Oh, somewhere in between. <laughs> be careful of patent trolls, be care which means that you're the copyright infringer. Also, be careful of infringing, of, of like having your copyright infringed. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like businesses that aren't particularly modi could go out of business. Sort of my takeaway. Well, how do you assess a moat? There's a good question. 
Well, I mean, I I think that like, you know, I mean, I, I spent the morning reading about transdime, right? So this uh, this person that was talking about it was talking about how they generally in aerospace, if you own the IP, that's a pretty good place to play. And one of the things that makes it tough for a lot of people to compete in aerospace is like you need to be able to invest the money today in anticipation of the back end, right? So like the upfront development costs on the platform are not where you're making much of your money at all. So you're making it on the back end. But then if you own the IP, like, and you're the sole source, I mean, that's pretty modi, I would think. What's an example of that? Well, Transdime. But but in just specifically, like, what's that? What are they doing? Well, they're making uh, they're making they're like aftermarket small. Aren't they? No, I mean that's where they make a lot of their money. But they they make they they integrate themselves in the supply chain up front, and then on the back end, they're the people that own the IP, and they tend to be like the sole source of small ticket item, like small dollar value. Single source, toilets. highly engineered parts. So when the uh, the OEMs are developing their thing, they come in and they say, "We'll help you." They they are integral to that process of developing whatever it is, and say, "We'll supply the parts." And then down the yeah, road, yeah, they make like little antennas. They'll make like the, uh, I mean, like little seatbelt buckle stuff. They'll make uh, something that you put wires through that goes into. Uh, like, you know, in the cockpit and whatever. So it's like little stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to once it's already on a plane. And certainly as it's long into the life cycle, it doesn't make sense to like stand up a secondary manufacturing plant that then you need to have like go through all the FAA regulations and it's not so easy to copy where, like, I think Heiko goes after sort of easier to copy parts. Transdime focuses on stuff that's, like, more highly engineered and smaller tickets size. It's a bit like sugar in the U.S. where we pay, like, 2x the world's normal price for sugar. Um, mostly, I think, due to some kind of tariffs or something. But um, but we, but nobody notices or cares because it's like, what's your annual sugar budget? Uh <laughs> You know, it rounds to zero, so no one cares. It does that support high fructose corn syrup or something like that? Uh, I'm thinking like of actual, real, like granulated sugar, but but isn't that like one's a I substitute mean, for the other? So you keep you keep sugar expensive, and it makes the the other one kind of uh, competitive. Mm. I don't know. I'm just asking. I'd be interested yeah. to see a list of the companies that went out of business. I, I mean. It's forty percent of the Russell three thousand. It's a long list. Yeah, I, I understand, but I guess what I'm saying is like you know we talk about oh well the Russell is trading at a cheap valuation relative to the Nasdaq. I would be interested to know how many of those companies are tech. Well, that's I mean, maybe three thousand, not the two thousand. It's all of them. It's the top three thousand. Okay. It's all not right. necessarily like a um, small cap versus Nasdaq. Nasdaq's quite big these yeah. days. I guess I just want to know, I mean, which of the companies. I'd like to see a list. I know it's a long list. I get it. 1,200 companies. Long, long and I, distinguished. I just, I, I would be interested to know what the multiple was before they went in. I'd I mean, sometimes. see how moody they were at one point in their lives. Yeah. Kodak. Big moat. At one stage, I mean, yeah. you know, people like make joke of that. How long could you have invested in Kodak? Like, yes, I agree, the last year would have been bad, but Kodak had, like, a pretty good run. Yeah. If you were early in Kodak, I don't think that you were like, oh, fuck, it went out of business eventually. It was a nifty 50. Yeah. But isn't, it, isn't that saying, like, it's not, when you fall out of a high window, it's not the fall that kills you. It's, the, it's just that last little bit where you hit the ground at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, I just don't know. I don't know how much of this is like, could you own businesses and monitor them and then see some of this coming, right? And like, yeah, you're going to take a markdown at some point, but what would you look for? Fear of the... I don't know. I mean, you got to look at KPIs, I guess. Like for Transdime, you certainly wouldn't want to see a secondary player into the market, right? That kind of busts the whole thesis. 
for cable, I think you want to see how they're taking share of, you know, other customers. And if people started to take share from them, I probably wouldn't stick around to see why with all the leverage. Um, I don't know. I think every, every situation is pretty different, right? I think with beer, probably people would have said, you know, when, when, uh, the volume decline started, you didn't want to really hang out, especially in bud. I mean, I, I did, but mm-hmm. it was a loser. So, I mean, Bud's a tough one, right? Because it was Buffett bought some Bud in like two thousand and five, I want to say, before the acquisition. When did when did beer really start being a uh, declining industry, or macro beer start it being was a declining, declining industry? When he, when he bought it, it was already declining. I mean, that's what creates yeah. the opportunity, right? But then you got Sam. I looked at Sam was cheap maybe two years ago, something like that. And Sam's had a monster run since then. Yeah. Well, truly took off too, right? So that helps. Is that, that's what that's the hot sells has done it? Yeah. I well, I don't know if it's done it, but I think that's uh that's some of what's going on there. I think there's a lot I mean, more. I don't randomness know, you gotta monitor it. this stuff. How do you know anything? Well, that's what I think. That's kind of my position. Like that, I saw there was a question about Dan Rasmussen saying that you know you can't really moats don't help much. I, that's sort of my view. That like for most companies, there's like ninety six percent of companies, there's no real decent moat in there. It's just there's a four percent that do seem to be pretty persistent. But I think they're almost each one of them is like a unique situation. It's not, I don't know how much of a lesson you can draw from it. You know, it's sort of each one is unique. For it, so have you, have you been on Twitter? There's moats everywhere. I, I Every see. company has moats. They're all moaty. It does look that way. There's there are some moats out there though. I just don't know if you can draw broad lessons from it. I think that it's like a. And you, if you disagree, it'll check the stock price. <laughs> that is true. It's been a good <laughs> run for uh, for moaty businesses. All right, I feel like we've thrashed this one to death. What uh, what do you got, JT? <laughs> Have we? I don't know. I mean, I'm just <laughs> uh, so yeah. Paul Graham, uh, who I don't. Do you guys have much experience with any of his work or ideas? Yeah, I re- when I was in when I was a uh, tech M and A lawyer in San Francisco, someone gave me uh, his book. Just the name of it escapes me at the moment. So it's been a long time since I've read it. Is it Hackers? And yes, Tankers? that's the one. I've got that back there somewhere. I, I love the book, yeah. and I, I read his. Um, I read his website when he puts up a new essay. I found them to be pretty insightful. I think he's he's uh, an interesting thinker. I have no idea who he is. Good. All right. So, well, just as a little background then, uh, for Bill's sake and everyone else maybe. Uh, so, Paul Graham is this, he's a computer scientist, essayist, and venture capital guy now in that he was uh, one of the founders of Y Combinator. So he's he's probably doing okay, um, but he has this book, Hackers and Painters, and it's it's quite good. Like there's um, I mean, some of the the talk about like programming languages might not be as interesting for someone. Although there he are advocates some Ruby cool on ones. Rails right over uh, C plus plus or whatever it was. Uh, that's not not quite right, but yeah. What, what, uh, he what likes was it? This one called Lisp is Lisp, the okay. programming language okay. that he likes. But um, it's been a long time. Since so in it. chapter nine of, of the book, it's called uh, Taste for Makers, and it's actually available on his website, too, if you want to read the that that section. Uh, but, you know, he's talking about how like mathematicians will call good work like beautiful, and it kind of has its own meaning. And and other uh, other domains have also sort of adopted the idea of beautiful, whether it's, uh, you know, scientists or engineers or musicians or architects. Uh, designers, writers, and coders. So he he looks through all these different domains and tries to draw out the similarities of really like what what make how do you make good stuff? And so I thought, well, all right, I'm, we can uh, start with where you know these the different domains that he saw and and cr- like how do they make good stuff there? And he took it to c- then kind of computer programming, and we can then take it one step farther and try to apply it to. A portfolio or, or investing more broadly so so he has like 14 different sort of axioms about what makes something beautiful 
but we'll pick out a handful of them and um, and see if we can get through them and see what interesting things come out of it. But so number one, good design is simple. So in math, a shorter proof is is always better. Um, you know, good computer programming is very tight. Good writing is is concise and you know Hemingway wrote at like a fifth grade level right like Toby I mean maybe talk a little bit about like some of your experience with with writing and and simplification yeah I th- my first uh three books were written probably where I normally write and then uh acquire as multiple I read uh that in the after the second world war they discovered that um a lot of the guys who were on the boats the naval boats couldn't read the manuals because they were written by engineers and the guys who were expected to operate them in many cases you know were unqualified to some degree and so they went and they standardized writing to work out what are the in, what are the indications of so if someone can read to a fifth grade level or a tenth grade level and basically it's the number of syllables in a sentence the number of syllables in a word the number of words in a sentence and they have different um, scales of measuring it and basically it, it it determines how complex or how complicated your writing is and how how many years of education you need to be able to understand it and so uh, what they've then found is they've gone and they've looked at you know famous writers and see what level they write to and there's a pretty strong correlation between the lower the grade level and the more commercially successful your book so um, Harry Potter is written to a very low grade level. And it's one of the most successful books around. Dan Brown writes to a fifth grade reading level. Ernest Hemingway got a Nobel Prize for Literature, writes to a fifth grade reading level. I find Ernest Hemingway a little bit hard to read, but, uh, you know, Dan Brown, it's a page turn and they're very short, very short chapters. But So basically, the, the more complex you're writing, the fewer people who can read it, the less commercially successful you are. I think it's a... And it's, I found that to be true too. Acquirer's Multiple is much more successful as a book. It's also cheaper. So, so there's that. And I think the good writing has a crispness to it as well that is, you know, there's an economization of words that really, like the English language is rich enough that you can, there's almost a right word that you can pick that will eliminate two to three other words that, uh, you know, would be descriptive to help try to craft the sentence. Um, and so taking this to an investment contest context i think you know a good investment thesis is simple and you know it's kind of back of the napkin doesn't have a lot of moving parts that can you know if any one of those links in the chain breaks and it destroys your whole thesis uh you know that's a lot more fragile than a a very simple back of the envelope kind of calculation and an idea um which is why i actually find like a lot of macro things really compelling but also I'm very uh, cognizant of the fact that you need like 12 different things to all happen in the right order for this whole like magical puzzle to to pop out that, uh, you know, here's how you would win. Um, So I put that to, you know, uh, Jason, uh, who runs Mutiny Fund, I I, I said to him, that's the problem that I've always seen with macro is that the idea might be compelling, but it's like it's all in series. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. By the time you got six things in series where it's just a coin flip, the number of possible outcomes is so huge, it's really hard to get paid. And he said, yes, but that's the way to make the bet really convex. So I was like, that's kind of interesting that you can put on a more blunt version of it and probably be more likely to get some return. But if you put on that one that, you know, if you can narrow it down to like, oh, uh, we're, you know, I've got this thesis that something's going to happen in Japan. So I want to be like short JGB, you know, vol puts or calls or something, whatever they're trying to, you know, if yeah. they're doing it to that level, that's because, so Kyle Bass can say, this is the most convex trade I've ever seen in my life, like that kind of stuff. You get three sevens in a row on your slot machine. That's it. You know, you get really all the get cherries, paid. all the cherries came up. <laughs> Bill, any thoughts on simplification in your investing world? Uh, yeah, I just think a whole lot of hard needs to get you to the simple part. Mm, we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, so next thing, good design is timeless. And, you know, in math, every proof is timeless unless it has some kind of error in it, right? Almost by definition, um, good proofs are timeless. Um 
Kelly Johnson, who was a manager and kind of like brains behind the Skunk Works projects that produced the U2 and the SR-71, uh, said that, um, you know, an airplane that looks beautiful will will fly beautifully. And, you know, and I think like if you look at the SR-71, like to me, that's like a really timeless looking airplane. Like it, it still looks badass, even though it's what, like yeah, 60 years old or something. But isn't didn't they say about those things that there were two problems with them, right? They they weren't they didn't fly, and I might be wrong about the SR seventy one. That's the Blackbird, right? I can't remember which ones. Which I read that book too, and he said there are two things that really bothered him. They just sat on the, it sat it on the, uh, you know, they were designed at some sort of pressure, so they assumed that they'd get up into into the air, and it at all, it, all of the metal would expand. But basically, while they sat on the tarmac, they just leaked all over the place. Oh yeah, and mm. I, it may not have been the SR seventy one. It might have been like later the the stealth fighters. But he said basically they couldn't. You can't fly them. You need a computer to help you fly them because otherwise they're just not aerodynamic. They just fall through this. They're like rocks that fall through the sky that a computer flies for you. Hmm. All right. Well, they still look badass. So don't don't ruin that <laughs> part for me. <laughs> I think that's also true of the um, boats. The boats don't. I I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's interesting. So one one of the nice things about being timeless is that it's it's sort of in a way to evade fashion, right? And you know when you like he he references sort of he doesn't call it the Lindy effect, but it's a little bit like that. But if you design something that would appeal to someone in the 1500s, it has a better chance of appealing to someone in 2500. Um, so like, you know, a good drawing uh, or a, you know a good painting ruffles that was around the neck. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's a little bit more fashion. Um, so I think, you know, like for me, like the timelessness in a in an investment context in a portfolio is really like, you know, a well-run kind of long duration minded business that and really like focusing on cash flows and actually like cash as you know, cash sometimes is important in the investment world and other times it doesn't matter as much. But I think that is a bit of a fashion as well. And, but I think over the long term, like you can anchor to the fact that, you know, good cash flow producing business um, in 2500 is still going to be important, just like it was in 1500. Uh, and although we forget about it occasionally, in, in, it's more fashionable to, you know, be not really worried about cash sometimes. But there, I think it, it's always a touchstone for me to come back to. Let me just throw a let me play devil's advocate for a moment because we one of the great articles that you did your veggies on a, a little while back was the um, you know how long something had survived and how long it was like this is the Lindy the Lindy test and so somebody had done this analysis and they had said that basically the length of so, the, the the length of time that something has been alive is like an irrelevant factor for how long it continues to survive so Lindy is not right. Uh, I think Lindy, if you're if we're being like strict about it, um, is that if you know nothing else about something, you have to assume that you're somewhere in the middle of the life of it, just statistically speaking. Uh, you, the odds that you're at the beginning or the end are probably less likely, which leads you to the middle, which then means that it's about half of its life right now. Damn, that's good. <laughs> All right. The next thing is, uh, and this goes back to you, Bill, with, uh, you know, good design is hard. And, you know, in math, like the difficult proofs are, they require a lot of ingenious uh, thinking and, and solving, um, the in ingenious solutions. You know, a small budget is what will produce a really elegant design. A lot of times the constraint is what creates the creativity. Um, but that's not easy, right? And the best art is, has always been the painting of people. And so like you could paint a tree and if one of the arms of the, tr you know, the, the branches of the tree is off by five degrees, like no one's going to notice or really care because it just sort of is like, all right, well, that's just what that tree looks like. But if you paint someone and you're off by five degrees, as far as like their, you know, where their eyes are, uh, like that's very noticeable. Right. So, uh, you know, and that's not easy to do, obviously. So, and, and the other thing too, is like, uh, you know, wild animals, he says are beautiful because they live hard lives. Uh, which I think is kind of a, a, a nice thing to say, uh, or it's interesting. So in this investment context, and you guys can fill in more here, but like to me, 
you know, it requires a lot of research to understand a company. Like it's not always easy. It's hard. And it's, you know, if it's, if this game is too easy to you, I have to kind of wonder about like, do you really understand some of the risks that you might be taking? Um, and of course, you know, your psychology is always going to be tested in this. Um, maybe like few other pursuits, um, you know, it really is you against yourself a lot of times. I think it's only, it's always you against yourself. There's nothing else there. Yeah, I like uh, I like Elliot Turner's concept of a uh, like a malevolent Mister Market. Male- right? Malevolent like the, or benevolent? Yeah, malevolent. 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 Yeah, what? I'm the, getting tongue twisted. The right? main but one. He's like the evil one. He's trying to get you to act the wrong way. Huh. Yeah. All right. Uh, good design uses symmetry. So a lot of this is like repetition and recursion. Um, and you, you see that a lot in nature, right? Like there's a lot of repetition that's used, kind of fractal patterns, things like that. Um, if you look at the Eiffel Tower, it's actually like a tower on top of a tower. Um, and that's a kind of a recursive idea. Uh, so, you know, for me in the investment context, that is, I think a lot of times like sort of pattern recognition, like you've done a particular kind of investment or you recognize something about a business and it looks similar to something else that you've been successful with or maybe not successful and you learn that lesson and you learn to avoid it then. Um, and then, you know, I think there's also maybe kind of an interesting argument to be made there with symmetry about uh, equal weighting of positions and the the humility of that. Um, so thoughts on that? I don't know. I've never bet big and lost yet, so I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> gauntlet thrown down <laughs> no i'm not i'm just i'm not trying to be like an, an ass about it it's just like i bet big a couple times and i i bet big on trans diamond march i bet big on curate when i told everyone i was doing it uh you know so i don't know i haven't bet big and loss so maybe if i take a big loss then i'll change my opinion but thus far um my higher weighted bets have, I bet big on charter like things have worked out when I bet big so I have a uh, hard um, it's not easy for me to understand the concept of an equal weighted portfolio if I'm spending all this time to try to figure out when a bet is worth making symmetry is tough I don't have, I don't I can't really imagine how you apply that at this point I got to think about that a little bit more but I'd, yeah, maybe that maybe that does make sense in a in a portfolio. Maybe that is symmetry in a portfolio. Well, let's see. I mean, Toby, you run well. Long yeah. short is symmetry in yeah. some ways. Yeah, it's a little bit unbalanced to be more to favor the long, but that's because the long tends to go up more often than the short goes down, and the short goes up. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I like the I like the. I think that. Equal weighting is just what you say when you get down to the, you're already at the very pointy end of a big data set and you're kind of just saying out of all of these positions, I don't know which of these at this pointy end are going to be the better ones. And I think it's hard going through that list. I've done that many times looking back perspective, looking back historically to try and work out, you know, not knowing what worked. It's hard to figure out which ones are the ones that are going to work. If you went through and you know, cut out the tech, well, then you missed Microsoft and you missed some of the big, big winners. If you, you know, retail, you miss Ross stores. If if you have some sort of rule for things that you miss, like I think possibly everybody else is doing the same thing. So I don't know. That's why I get to equal it. Yeah. I mean, that is sort of, I mean, that was Joel Greenblatt's observation when people were given discretion over the magic formula picks and they all underperform just the unconstrained version of it. It's tough. I don't know if that continues to apply, but that was it was a fairly short time period. That was the only thing. My two cents only ran for about 20 months. Yeah. Uh, next thing, good design resembles nature. And this one is kind of obvious based on, you know, if you've listened to this show at all and our, uh, you know, incessant use of nature for trying to explain things. But, um, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it has to do with it. Nature has had a long time to optimize and had a lot of, it's a very large N. And so you get that big of a population size um, and that many observations, you can start to sort of trust that whatever comes out of it is true. Um, so, 
Yeah, I don't. I don't. We need, you don't need to really belabor the nature part of it because uh, we do that every week. But um, so the next thing, I'll just move on. A good design is redesign. So you know, apparently, like Leonardo da Vinci basically invented sketching. Um, you know, where it was like he. It was a lot of like writing over things, moving a line a little bit. Um, you know, it's just like constantly reworking it, and and. As you know, Toby, I'm sure you speak to this on writing, but like good writing is just like it's total crap when it starts out. And, you know, like your first draft is such garbage and it's just the meticulous working it over and over the materials just until you almost hate the material uh, as the author (laughs) Uh, that that leads to eventually good writing. So you're just kind of sketching and then just just relentless pressure on it to turn it into good writing. Yeah, there's a there's a good. It might even be Paul Graham who said it. He said something like, "When you start out, you have you have better taste than you have skill." And so the first thing that you write down, and this is this is sort of through a career as well. But the first thing you write down is to, or draw or paint or whatever is terrible. And then as you get better, your your skill matches your taste. But it's also true for each individual thing that you do. The first draft is diabolically difficult to get out. And then it's really easy to go through and edit and rewrite. I mean, it's much not really easy. It's easier than, than the first draft because the first draft is impossible. So you got to get the first draft out and down as quickly as you possibly can because it only starts getting better from there. So even if it's bad, it's better to have it out. So and in the investment context, I think um, I think sometimes people are guilty of getting the idea into their portfolio and then they sort of stop thinking about it and they stop sketching and they stop redesigning they stop rewriting it's just well that's one of my positions let's go look for another one right and um you know to go to to ian castle's point about you know he spends 80 percent of his time on the things that he owns to make sure he understands it um you know that's sort of like the the writing equivalent of you know of rewriting in the investment context like you kind of sketch it out at the beginning but once you've owned it for a while like that's your actual like rewriting over and over resketching um and doing a better job of your matching your understanding with reality as you go um so i think that's kind of a it's probably a pretty helpful idea to keep in keep in mind yeah i really like that one too i like ian castle's idea there is you just keep on the longer you hold it the better you know it so you're not going to get you know you're not going to sell out precipitously if uh, something happens in it that if you studied it closely enough you would have known that that was coming anyway there's some small change it's not really material sort of what we were talking about earlier that you just need to follow the things that you own closely enough so that you can see if there's some change i don't know if you can pick those things that are uh like potentially game ending for those businesses maybe you can i don't know maybe maybe you're paid to just if you think that there's something that's going to be if there's another competitor that's potentially game ending, maybe you hedge it by taking a small position in that competitor, knowing that by the time that competitor gets big enough to really damage your business, you've already got the stake. So you you, you kind of uh, you got a big enough size in each. Yeah, that's the what that's the what if of like why didn't Sears buy just five percent of Amazon? on when it was an early competitor just to hedge a little bit of their own taking a little bit of netflix sure as an investor you can do that you don't have to let the 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 business doesn't have to do it for you You can do it externally hedge your blockbuster stake with the position in netflix that's kind of an interesting topic all by itself i don't know if you can i have to think about that one how would you hedge all of the positions in your portfolio with the competitors yeah i don't think you want management running a hedge fund on your behalf but they kind of like are in Sears, some sense. Aren't Sears, they? Who knows the industry but better? Sears though. got fucked because Sears sucked. Sears yeah. didn't get screwed because they didn't take a position in Amazon. They got screwed because they stopped investing in their business. You could walk through those aisles. They were full of shit. They got under inventory. They invested a bunch of money in a crap app. And like, I'm sorry, I don't think a five percent position in Amazon was going to save them. Wouldn't save they them, just but it might spent save you. That money in a bad way. As a Sears investor. A Sears, it wouldn't save them, but it might save you as a Sears investor or the Sears Probably family. Not, man, Lampert probably would have taken out some loan and, uh, you know, put the shares in, uh, leaned them up against ESL Investment Trust. <laughs> like, that's what he did with all the good real estate. Why wouldn't he have done it with the shares? No, what I'm saying is you as an investor don't have to 
ride Sears all the way into the toilet. You can you yeah, can take you can buy it. You can externally you can say, well, Amazon's a real threat to this thing. I'm not prepared to sell out, but yeah. I'm I'm going to buy this little thing over here. Yeah, but I don't want. So my what would you hedge your uh, hedge your REIT with Zoom? Is that like a a play? Maybe. <laughs> I think that's yeah, a, I mean, it's an interesting I way to approach the problem. I mean, you know, I don't know. I said that, like, I haven't taken a big loss on a big position. I guess the airlines were a big position. I did take a loss. I wonder if Zoom had sort of, like, cut in over time. Like, would I have been able to notice that I was in a melting ice cube? Like, I don't know. That's, like, a harder question for me to answer. I guess it it was easier this time around because when the world stopped... I was just like, oh, this is clearly different. So, you know, I, I don't, I guess I, I don't have a good answer simply because I don't have one. All right. Well, I'm all done. I shot my wad. <laughs> Whatever you guys want to <laughs> talk about. Now. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, I mean, I agree with, I agree with what Ian's saying. Um, but then, you know, you got Charlie and, and Boyd, right? And and he's our BYD, and he's basically like, yeah, I'm just going to hold it. So, you know, like, I don't know. At, at what point, when do you, when do you act? It, it seems as though among most of the investors that I admire, price is not a valid reason to sell. And that, that seems to be a very, very consistent theme. So then you get to the question, well, who are all of the investors that held and then everything bombed out underneath them? But, I mean, Acri, Buffett, um, I mean, Malone flip stuff. Uh, but, like, Munger, I mean, Munger said straight up, I don't understand why BYD is valued this way. Are you going to sell? Probably not. They're good at what they do. So, like, I, I don't know. It seems to me that price is a valid reason to buy, and the more and more I read people that I seem to respect, uh, now maybe this is just like a market cycle top, you know, I don't know, but you're talking about Buffett and Munger, Jake. I mean, so if you don't like them, then who's your role model? Because it's not as if I'm just like pointing to some crazy tech bro, right? I mean, I'm talking about Munger. There's a good quote from Bill Gurley that I had put up today where he says, the power of compounding for these platforms is so huge. If you invest in an Amazon or whatever, the hardest thing to do is close your eyes and forget it. There's a little bit more to it than this. But his point is, the only thing analysis is going to cause you to do is to sell the stock. So he's like, just close, yeah. your, close your eyes and just keep on holding. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you're wrong. I think it's, it's uh, if, if it... If most of the returns come from a few huge winners and you go and truncate those winners by doing too much analysis and selling too early, then and when those results that the business results come out that you could never have imagined in your wildest dreams, right? Like that is sort of what turns into those yeah. uh into those outcomes. Yeah, I mean it makes it really hard not to not to trim something that um, maybe you're better off ignoring and letting happen. But I do think there's probably got to be a lot of, uh, there's got to be a lot of dead, quiet evidence in survivorship bias in this, in this analysis, right? I don't know. I mean, I, I've been talking about David Gardner for almost a year now. I mean, he, this is how his theory works. I, I think he I think he probably looks for a bigger addressable market than I'm maybe used to like pushing myself to think to. But I think he swings at things he thinks he can really, really win and then he holds them. And then he just lets math take over. Because if your upside is a two trillion dollar company and your downside zero, then you can sort of mitigate that with a bet. Right. If, if both are one percent going in and the upside is one on one is, you know, whatever percent infinite, basically, and the other is down 100, as long as you can keep taking shots on goal, uh, it's not the craziest strategy. That's something that I, I don't know why it outperforms an index. That's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around. But... Yeah. 
I uh, have been doing a little bit of that, like trying to work on some never sell ideas. And uh, I did some, you know, I've been doing testing of it where just as far back in my data set as I can go, just run the run the screen, see what happens if you hold it to today. And that's that's what happens. Like you have, it starts looking more like a, um, you know, VC type portfolio where you have a handful of monster winners and you have plenty that go to zero. So, you know, if you, if you think about the kind of, like I've discussed this a number of times, but high return on equity, high gross margins, high um, operating margins, all those sort of things that we would all agree basically are, indicate a company that's doing very, or a business that's doing very well. When you run those screens, you still pick up stuff like you would have bought a whole lot of for-profit colleges um, when they were kind of, when they got cheap just before they all got wiped out. How would you avoid those sort of things? The for-profit colleges? Yeah. I'll tell you when I got interested in them was when they got cheap. Yeah, right? me too. So, I don't know. Like, I, You know, so here's a different, uh, this is a tangential thought, but it's somewhat similar. I was listening to Cobra Global on the Twitter machine. He was talking about Europe. You know, and everybody's, well, not everybody, but I've seen people citing like the valuation dispar- disparity between Europe and, you know, the U.S. And he was like, I, sorry, first of all, I'll trigger warning the people that think that I'm some crazy crony capitalist or socialist from last week because y'all can't <laughs> listen. That's not my fault. That's yours. Uh, you know, he was like, if you look at the EU, they can't like a lot of the countries can't actually stimulate because they're bound by EU restrictions on what their deficit is allowed to be. And then the EU is trying to get like cute with how much they're paying on the vaccines. So now they're going into lockdown and they're going to be austere and we have the vaccine and we're not. So to all you that said that I don't know what I'm talking about, guess what? We got a test case. And if I'm right, you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> and to anybody that said that I had a big head, <laughs> I want everybody to know that I 100% owe Toby and Jake everything. And you can go fuck yourself I, too. I thought, I thought you meant physically a big head. Don't worry no, about no, that, no. mate. Your head's proportionate. I know I'm pretty decent looking that I'm aware of. So, no, but I don't know. I, I just think um, I've gotten into trouble when I've let valuation start to drive my research. That's when I've really started to, like, get myself in trouble. Uh, like, that's the reason, that's the cause of you looking yeah. at something? Yeah, like, I think, like, when I'm on the fence and I'm like, ah, but it's cheap. That's when I really get myself in trouble. But here's my question. Like, that's a phenomenon of the last kind of since 2010, right? Basically, since 2010, it's been value hasn't been much of a uh, contributor to returns it's been at the bottom of every you know when you when you do an attribution of returns like this is sadly but when you do an attribution of returns in any given year like valuation has kind of been it's not there historically that's a little bit unusual most of the time value does pretty well yeah um but that's in any given year right i mean are well, it's over that we're f- picked- last 11 years, since 2010, mid-2010. Yeah, I like, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I fully understand in a wrapper that is mechanical why valuation would be a valuation first decision. In the more discretionary portfolios, I think you're almost betting, like, that I, I guess that maybe I'll just, say what it's done to me and we'll see you know there are some other people that it doesn't do it to but i think that if i look at valuation i underweight business quality and i think that like there are a lot of of places the more that i know about the market that like cheap really indicates a lot of problems and i don't know I, I don't have a good answer. I got someone's thrown a uh, castle quote from the Business Brew podcast. Uh, some of the best buy and hold investors had their best performance come in high turnover years. Buffett had 80% turnover over 20 years. Same with Lynch, Greenblatt, 200%. Yeah. That yeah. Happens. So I think I, I would. Uh, I had some my... pushback from a pretty smart person on that, that I'm, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I'm not like ready to. I haven't done the work, but like this guy is pretty smart. So. Let's go back to the the for-profit college idea. I think um, if you're going to be sort of a never-sell mentality, which is sort of what we're talking about again, 
I think you have to really have a business that has a uh, long, long sustainability, right? A lot of resilience. And I would argue the for-profit colleges were uh, not playing fairly with all constituents in the ecosystem, which would eventually have led to some kind of defection and problems for them. And when you get into that, uh, it, I don't think you can hold those forever, and re especially regardless of valuation. Um, whereas if you can find a, a, a cleaner shirt business, that to me makes it more likely of a candidate to be in your never sell pile. The problem for the for-profit colleges, like they were, they were basically subsidized by the government, right? But they were, they were getting, um, as, as sort of all universities are, as all colleges are, they were subsidized by the fact that you could take out a big loan to, to buy these things. So my thought process at that time was to go through and try and find the ones where basically they were learning a trade. So ESS, which is Los Angeles, um, that's the ticker. I just The name of it just escaped me. It was pretty well known at the time. I, I asked my wife about it because she's an LA local. She's seen them advertise on television forever. And I thought, well, they make they help people get trades, like become a mechanic, become something Welding like that. Welding. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, if there's anything that's going to survive this, it's going to be ESS. No, ESS or ESINQ, I think it is now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because it's bankrupt. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. The whole education industry in general is a racket. I'm not. I'm not a. I sometimes wonder if the average college was public and under the scrutiny of short sellers, whether or not it would still exist. But you get those. You get those times where it's a great business. Like it's quantitatively a great business. Um, and here's your opportunity to buy it at a good valuation. And like, that's kind of the, that's, you know, that's what I perceive Buffett to be doing. He's trying to buy really good businesses when they just get that moment. And so the last example is Apple. Like it just, for whatever reason, it traded down. I think it was on like 10 times EVE, but something like that. It was just too cheap. And he buys it. And that's kind of what he does. He buy like he's, he's not wonderful companies at fair prices. He's wonderful companies at very, very cheap prices. But he's, you know, still yeah. buying the wonderful companies yeah. out of that bucket. He's not buying the... <clears throat> Like I don't know that that's, <laughs> that's not really true because he says in his private, I mean, I don't know. I, I wonder if Pilot Flying J was like a really wonderful price. It gets harder, I think, when you get bigger to find the wonderful price. Yeah. So. And he used to do it with crappy companies that he could take over control of too, which... I wouldn't want that life. I just spent some time talking to Kyle Sermonara, and he seemed to go through some stuff that I'd rather not go through. So, uh, turnarounds of of uh, inherited dog poo poo is not exactly my idea of a great a great existence. I think he'd argue it's not his either. I got a good comment here. Never sell was a way for value investors to hold on to the best businesses at thirty times earnings when they initially bought in at ten times. I I kind of agree with that, and. What I say, it the, the way that I kind of um, justify it, I don't do this. This is just, I'm trying to think through if I had something more discretionary, this is something that I might do. The, uh, the way that you get the right tail is you have to be in these things that start running. And for whatever reason, the business quality gets better over the time that you hold it. And I always give it, the best example of that, I think, is Microsoft. Because Microsoft in 2010, 11, 12, that kind of time, they were pitching it at value investors' congresses and it was 11% free cash flow yield with one year of earnings uh, revenue declines run by Steve Barmer. Stock hadn't gone anywhere for 13 years. It wasn't a uh, compounder type stock at that point. And since then, uh, and Satya Nadella had just taken over, so he was unproven. Since then, Satya Nadella is probably a business genius. They've turned it into a, a, compound, a software as a service type business and it's run a million miles and it probably it's still roughly fairly valued even though it's up a lot and the multiple's gone up a lot. Yeah, I mean, here, I'll say something that triggers people. Uh, maybe like value investing is the disease that gets people to sell that thing at 20 times earnings to buy the next thing at 10 times earnings that turns into some Brookfield property situation where you get taken under. So I guess it's just like it's – I just don't 
I think these rules are like so difficult. Like it's so hard to have. I don't know what you do. like. I'm I'm dealing with it right now with some of my portfolio. It's trading it at valuations that I'm not particularly comfortable with. But like, what what am I gonna do? Well, congrats to everybody who's got to to... long term capital gains. Yeah, <laughs> tomorrow, yeah, no, long term you know, capital gains tomorrow. Today, woo! But it's like, what are you gonna do? Like, I I don't know. I'm what would I? So I sell it. I got to pay taxes. Then I got to come up with another idea. Nothing is cheap right now. So the opportunity, like, I don't know. I don't know what you do. I, I did a little study at one point where I looked at the uh, the value gurus versus the value studies. And the idea was to try to figure out, like, is the the simple model really the, you know, the floor and not the ceiling of what's possible, um, as some have argued? And what's interesting, and a lot of this has to do, I think, with liquidity differences in a, in a you know, back test model that just looks at like okay buy this sell this and it's not uh it's not as constrained especially if you got bigger uh you know in your buffet and you're trying to do things like you just don't have the same universe but regardless the what one hypothesis i had like so to the punchline is is that the models trounce even the gurus yeah and so but why and one hypothesis i had was actually that um you know, if you think about the value guru sort of participating in the irrationality of the intrinsic value being below price and catching the run up and then selling at intrinsic value, perhaps the model participates in that part of the spectrum, but because it mechanically holds for a year or two years or whatever, and it doesn't really care about what happens in the interim to valuation, it might participate on the upper half of the irrationality when something runs past intrinsic value and goes up to something that the value guy would have never been able to hold. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe that's where that extra premium comes from in the mechanical study. Um, I don't, it's a hypothesis. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I find it kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, the same thoughts occurred to me, not necessarily just against the, those guys, but that's a reason to hold on. To, you definitely have some things that run well beyond where you would buy them and part of it is like a multiple expansion and part of it is they have a good earnings print because they turn around and so they're much much more expensive than you would buy them or hold them but you don't have a rebalance state coming up so you, you sit in them um and that's the, there's a you know that graham has that rule where he says i hold on to it if it's run up 50 percent or i've held it for two years two which years. i think is one of the few graham rules that's a really bad one because what you want to do is uh, hold the things that have run up for two years and really, sorry, hold the things that have run up for 50% because you're truncating those winners. And then the two-year holding period is kind of meaningless. If it's still cheap, you should still be holding it probably. Yeah. Yeah. The guy's not a guru and he was born in the Depression. So, I mean, it makes sense that maybe his rules are he slightly... He wrote, wrote some books that are all right. That's right, but I don't think he's like do okay for himself. <laughs> okay, but but I don't think that Munger and I mean even Munger and Buffett have said they had to morph from him, right? I I don't think that like the notion of like the guy wrote a book, so it's timeless wisdom. I think the method of thinking is very timeless, but I don't think that like you can be like, well, it worked in the fifties, so it'll work today. Like that doesn't make sense to me. But it's the same idea, right? Like, so you could look at you could look at um, John Maynard Keynes. He describes a, a method of investing that basically sounds like what Buffett does today. Yeah. Where he says, you know, look for the compounders, only hold a handful of them that you fully understand. Like you can read him and it sounds like Buffett. And Buffett's quoted him and it sounds like Buffett. Yeah. Buffett also learned from Graham, right? And then Buffett morphed. So, I mean, it's like I think that there's different things for different personalities. For sure. So what's, what's value 3.0 then? Compounders, software as a service. No, that was that was two point oh. Compounders. You you you. Uh, I don't know. I think long short is going to have a pretty good. Uh, I think long short's probably a pretty good strategy going forward. Bless up. Just because it's sucked ass for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think you know. I mean, it seems to be one of the things that's uncorrelated, right? Um, I don't know. Somebody said it's the new sixty the forty, direction. and I think that makes sense. Well, it's definitely uncorrelated. I can I can attest to that. I got a, I got a question here. Uh, I think JT and I have talked about this a little bit, but 
interested to hear what you think now. If you were born 15 years later, would you still be value investors? Uh, Look, 15 I'll, years probably later? Not. I'll say this. I discovered value investing in the late 1990s and it was a full-blown tech, uh, you know, similar to like what we had late last year, I guess, when dot-coms were, were teeing off. And uh, that didn't make any sense to me and value made sense to me. So, yes, I certainly would still be because 15 years later probably coincides with this current dot-com 2.0. I think I would have also just because, um, you know, my whole life up until I knew even what value investing sort of stood for, I always liked getting deals on things and I hated paying retail. I was always looking to, you know, arbitrage something and feel like I was getting away with something. Um, and I, and I never, and I always probably would go more towards cheaper than quality, uh, in whatever I was doing. And so when I heard it described is, you know, doing that same idea, but for the partial ownership of businesses, it just made perfect sense to me right away. So that inoculation took, so I think I still probably would have fallen into the, uh, into the value bucket, even if it was 15 years after. I don't think, but I don't think Graham necessarily defined value as, cheap i think he said that like what i what i got from reading the the uh intelligent investor was that you should approach it in this sort of business-like fashion you should approach it like you're looking you're not trying to buy cool products or cool companies you're trying to buy you know streams yeah, of cash flows say, Dude, dog but, shit. but everybody <laughs> then, say but then everybody no but then everybody says the cheap right so if i offered you a ferrari like an F430 at a hundred grand and it was mint. Everyone, well, most people would agree like that's value. But for some reason, most value people are like, no, I want the Pinto for two grand. <laughs> and it's like, okay, but, but really rich stuff can also be value. But then when you pitch that, people are like, oh, you've abandoned your roots. It's like, no, I just think that's good value. I mean, it's scarcity accrues value over time. Scarce assets tend to trade at higher multiples. You can find value at higher multiples. God forbid you say that. People are like, ah, oh, did you even read, dude? Like, yeah, I did. But then Buffett says that too. Low, low multiples aren't necessarily value and high multiples aren't necessarily expensive. Yeah, well, people might be benefit from listening. The, the, the problem is that uh, you got, you know, I think the, the difficulty is this. When you look at the cohorts of stocks, uh, the cheaper cohorts do tend to do better than the more expensive cohorts. But the lottery tickets come out of the most expensive cohort. So if you're the kind of guy who can go through the most expensive one and pick out all of the Shopify's and the Amazon's and the micro, well, not Microsoft because that was cheap, but anything that out of that group and you can identify the ones that are winners, then you are well and truly paid to do that. If you're um, not able to do that and I'm not able to do that, then you need to be going through the stuff where your base rate's a little bit better. Dude, you say that, but I bet that the strategy that you're thinking of running on the side where you're like the invincible investor, where you are waiting for temporary hiccups in Modi businesses, I bet you could run that. Yeah, I think so. But you so still... that's, I mean, that's where I think you're looking. I mean, this is basically rule one stuff. I'm just not sure that I'm on fully on board with the bet size that he preaches, but... The, the only the only the only thing that I would say to that is um, this is what I'm trying to talk about it now like how do I avoid stuff like the for-profit colleges because it didn't look ob I just I just don't have a rule for avoiding that stuff I don't know I think something that um, something that I've I've sort of learned from Elliot and McMurtry a little bit is like they like to talk to people that are short um, and they like to understand like I think both those guys are good at understanding the case against what they own. And I think if you really force yourself to write that out and to say, okay, well, how would I argue the short side of this? I think that might be a good exercise That's to fair. make yourself like, like not even just like a pre-mortem, like, no, if I was short this, why would I be short? Like, what would I be looking at that would make me not like this? Well, what about yeah. some, like Intel is like something. Amazon or something like, you could have written a very compelling short of Amazon for multiple years. Yeah. And it, I mean, it almost went bankrupt a few times. So it's not like it was even like, this isn't a hypothetical. Yeah. And yet, 
you know, there's these survivors that turn into these absolute monsters. I don't know. It's really Yeah, but hard. a dude like Nick Sleep probably knew that short case and didn't think it was right. And maybe Nick Sleep isn't quite the investor that everybody thinks he is if AWS doesn't come out. But, like, he probably still retires. But you could have bought it cheap, too. It fell 94% from... He's fallen 90% plus a few times. But that early... Like, he got it in the early 2000s, down 94%. Maybe you're just like, you know what, this thing is better than it looks here, and I'll just grab some here. Yeah, and I then mean, David I, Gardner. I'm curious to see what the metrics look like, though, at that point. Like, what were you Pretty actually bad. comparing against? I doubt against? any of us would have seen it. Well, you could, it was look, an e-commerce bookstore. We would have been like, oh, Barnes & Noble is going to kill that. What, it, like, what was the cheapest it's ever traded on price to sales or something? Yeah, Maybe I'll, that would I'll be. pull that data up, and I'll, I'll tweet that out in a moment. Okay. But that's time, amigas. This was fun. This was a good chat. Yeah, indeed. Sorry we didn't take more questions. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> you guys got a good convo. I, I got some I got some in. We got some in. Thanks to me guys. We'll see you next week. Peace.